Welcome to the Power of Purity podcast, the show that empowers men to experience their sexual gift in a healthier way. Now here's your host, Tony Ingrassia. Hey guys, welcome back to the Power of Purity podcast. I'm really glad that you're with me today. As we begin a new series of episodes, I'm very excited, and I can't tell you how much time, energy, and effort I've invested in this particular series. I've really been working on it, I think it's fair to say, for months and months, and I've really tried to get this right, so I do pray that it will be a blessing and an encouragement to you as you continue on your journey of purity. But before I get into the podcast today, I thought I'd share with you guys one note that I received recently that was encouraging. This person says, Hi, Tony. I'm one month and seven days into God's journey of repentance for me since my confession. I listened to your story today on the podcast and heard that today was your day of confession years ago. I'll never forget the day that the heavy hand of God helped me to confess to my wife. I thought she would surely kick me out. Instead, the Holy Spirit gave her a gift to forgive me and show me amazing grace. I was so taken back that I became a prisoner of Christ. We are in counseling, and I'm trying to focus on pursuing my wife and creating a safe place for her to grieve and be what she needs to be. Thank you for your testimony. I can totally relate to the thrill-seeking aspects of porn at a young age while hiding it and taking risk. Those risks, 30 years later, ended in an affair of two years that almost took my family away. My wife and I have been married for 21 years. I've been enticed by porn for 36 years, but now through confession and repentance, it's gone from my life. I'm praying for a godly woman who's been through this to talk with my wife. The trauma I put her through leaves her so exhausted. If you know of any good material for her, please let me know. In his chains, and then the person signs the note. So thanks be to God. I'm so grateful that this individual found their way to the Power of Purity podcast and that it's been helpful and encouraging to them on their journey. And I'm so thankful that God was able to bring this person to a place, as they say, of repentance and confession, where they became willing to come into the light with themselves, with God, and with their wife. And this has created a remarkable new journey in this man's heart and life and in his marriage. And I just pray for God's blessing and mercy and grace and power as they move forward on the healing path that God has intended for them and for their marriage. Praise be to God. And with that being said, you guys, I'll just go ahead and begin this new episode today, which is kind of an introduction to this new series that I'm starting. And if you've been with me, you know that I just finished a series that I entitled 10 Things That Every Husband Should Know About His Wife When It Comes to Sex. And this now is the beginning of the companion series, which I've entitled 12 Things That Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex. And I have eight observations that I want to share with you guys in the way of introduction to this series. And the fact is that several of these observations, I think five of them, I touched on in the way of introduction to the previous series, but they do relate to this series as well, so I'm just going to touch on those five quickly. But then I have three additional observations in the way of introduction that are exclusive to this particular series. So here are the eight observations that I want to share with you in the way of introduction to this new series, 12 Things That Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex. And the first one is this, we're only talking about one side of the coin in this particular series. And it was in the previous series that we talked about 10 things that every husband should know about his wife. 
So in the same way a coin has two sides, heads and tails, in the previous series we looked at one side of the coin, ten things that every man should know about his wife, and now in this series we're looking at the other side of the coin, which is twelve things that every wife should know about her husband. The second observation is this, that there are exceptions to every rule. I mentioned, for example, in the previous series, that I think it's fair to say that as a general rule, men like to hunt more than women like to hunt, and women like to quilt more than men like to quilt, but there are exceptions to every rule, so it could be that there are some marriages and relationships where actually the woman likes to hunt more than the man, and maybe there's relationships and marriages where the man likes to quilt more than the wife likes to quilt. So, of course, there are exceptions to every rule, but I will say this, that the 12 principles that we're going to discuss in this series, I do believe, apply to most men in most situations. I've been a man myself now for 60 years, and I know a lot of men, and I've known a lot of men, and I've had, and I do have, a lot of male friends in my life. I'm a pastor, and I'm a counselor, and I'm the founder and director of a ministry called The Power of Purity. And in the context of these various expressions of ministry, I've worked with a lot of men, and I've worked with a lot of married couples. And what I'm saying is that through all these varied experiences of knowing a lot of men and working with a lot of men, I have no doubt and absolute confidence that the 12 principles that I'm going to share with you through this series relate to most men in most situations. And that brings me to the third observation, which is this. I encourage you to relate to this material the same way you'd relate to a good steak dinner take the meat, and throw away the bones. So as I go through this presentation, I trust that you will find more meat than bones and that you will agree with most of what I'm sharing and teaching. I'm sincerely doing my very best to share and to bring forth that which I believe is accurate and biblical and correct and honoring to God But you may or may not agree with every single thing that I say and the way that I say it. So therefore, I just encourage you, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Take the best, leave the rest, and relate to it the way you would to a good steak dinner. Take the meat and throw away the bones. Observation number four is this. I encourage you that if you are not married to still listen to this series of episodes, And I think that would be good for a couple reasons. And the first reason is because you might get married someday. And I would advocate that if you understand these 12 principles that we're talking about, it will prepare you to be healthier in the context of your marriage. So I think that this could be very helpful information, even if you're not married. And even if you never do get married, I think understanding the truth and the power of these principles will just give you a better grasp on life and of people and of relationships. So you have everything to gain by listening to this series, even if you aren't married yet. And that brings me to my fifth observation, which is this. The 12 points that I'm about to share with you are not necessarily listed in any order of priority, which means that principle four, five, and six are just as important as principle one, two, and three, and they're not less important because they come after principle one, two, and three. So in other words, it doesn't matter the order of the 12 principles. I think they're all strategic and important and significant and powerful principles and they are not necessarily listed in any order of priorities. But as I mentioned earlier, those are the five introductory observations that I shared also in the introduction of the previous series, but I now want to share with you three additional observations 
in the way of introduction to this particular series. And the reason I want to do that is because there's a very important point that I'm very concerned about, and I want to establish something with absolute clarity before we get into the 12 principles of this particular series. And the point is this, that as we talk about these 12 forthcoming principles and the reality of the various struggles that most men have with sex in their heart and life, that it could appear at first glance that the presentation of these 12 principles are exerting a kind of pressure upon women that could make women feel coerced or forced or compelled or even bullied into having sex with their husband, even if they're unable to participate sexually with their husband for whatever reason. And therefore, the next observation I want to establish with absolute clarity is this. This is observation number six. Under no circumstances whatsoever, 100%, absolutely, without exception, should any woman ever be pressured or coerced into having sex that's in any way a violation of her own conscience or personhood even sex with her own husband. And guys, this point is so supremely important that I want to say it again, only this time I want you to imagine that these words, as I say them, are written on a gigantic billboard, and they're written in neon lights, and they're surrounded by flashing strobe lights, and there's fireworks exploding all over the place directly behind the billboard. Or said another way, this observation is so important that I'm doing everything I can possibly do to bring attention to it and to establish this point with absolute clarity. So again, observation number six is this. Under no circumstances whatsoever, 100%, absolutely, without exception, Should any woman ever be pressured or coerced into having sex that's in any way a violation of her own conscience or personhood, even sex with her own husband? And now that we've established this observation, I'm going to share with you the next observation, observation number seven, which might be a little bit surprising to you because, in a way, it's almost antithetical to the previous observation that we just established with absolute clarity, which was observation number six. And by the way, the word antithetical is defined as directly opposed or mutually incompatible. And what that means is that the observation I'm about to share with you might seem like it's opposed to or incompatible with the observation I just previously shared with you. But that's the very reason that I want to set these two observations next to each other, side by side, and bring our attention to the tension that exists between them, because this tension is the very issue that I'm concerned about and the very issue I want to recognize and establish before I share the 12 things that every woman should know about her husband when it comes to sex. And with that being said, The next observation I want to share with you is this, observation number seven. The fact that no woman should ever be pressured or coerced into having sex that's in any way a violation of her conscience or personhood, even sex with her own husband, does not change the fact that her husband has very real and profound sexual needs in his life. So again, like two different sides of the same coin, this is the disclaimer that I want to establish before we begin the 12 principles of this podcast series, because I do sincerely believe, as we're going to see affirmed by the upcoming 12 principles, that men absolutely, positively have these deep and real and profound sexual needs in their heart and life and soul and that these needs do not go away, even if a couple, for whatever reason, 
happens to be living in a marriage where there's little to no sex happening within the context of the marriage. Or, to bring further clarity to the point that I'm trying to make here, let me try explaining what I'm trying to say this way. Imagine that there's a married couple, and for whatever reasons, there happens to be little to no sex happening within the context of their marriage. For example, maybe there's significant relational problems and issues within the context of the relationship. And because of these relational problems and issues, the couple simply isn't able to connect with each other on an emotional, relational, or sexual level. Like maybe the couple isn't even friends anymore, or maybe they've grown apart from one another, and their relationship is now defined by distance and disconnection and relational coolness, if not coldness. Or maybe they don't even like each other anymore, or maybe they don't even sleep in the same bedroom anymore, or maybe they don't even talk to each other anymore, or maybe the husband has such a problem with anger or workaholism, or alcoholism, that it's seriously damaged their relationship and their marriage. Or maybe the wife simply doesn't like sex, and isn't interested in sex, and doesn't want to participate in sex. And this could be true for any number of reasons, such as, maybe the wife literally, physically feels pain during intercourse, so sex is very uncomfortable and or unpleasant to her. Or maybe the wife has significant body image issues or self-esteem issues and simply doesn't feel good within her own skin and therefore she isn't comfortable being naked with her husband or having sex with her husband. Or maybe the wife has significant unresolved issues from her own past and story and she therefore feels significant regret and shame and pain around her own sexual self, and therefore it's very difficult for her to be sexual, even with her own husband, like maybe she was raped when she was 13 years old, or maybe she was very promiscuous in her youth and participated in many situations that she's now very ashamed of, or maybe she's had an abortion or several abortions, and she feels deep sadness or shame about her abortions. Or maybe she was raised in a very religious home, and it was preached to her for years over and over again that sex is dirty, and sex is nasty, and sex is filthy, and that she shouldn't have sex, and that she shouldn't enjoy sex. And these messages have been so embedded in her that she still feels uncomfortable having sex even with her own husband. And guys, I'm sure that I could probably go on and on and on identifying the many different reasons that married couples come to the place, for whatever reasons, where there's little to no sex happening between them within the context of their relationship and marriage. But here's the point I'm getting to, and it's simply this that just because sex isn't happening between a husband and a wife does not mean that they're no longer sexual persons who have very deep and real and profound sexual needs and drives and desires. Or said another way, when sex goes away in the context of a marriage, it does not necessarily mean that sex has gone away within the context of the people who happen to be in that marriage. And therefore, since both the husband and the wife are still flesh and blood human beings, and they're still sexual creatures, it's possible that one of them, or both of them, may still be struggling with very deep and very real sexual needs and desires and drives and passions. Even though there's little to no sex happening between them in the context of their marriage. And do you know what I wish I could report to you guys? I wish I could report that the level of sexual need and desire within the individuals of a marriage was commensurate with the level of sex that happens to be occurring within the context of that marriage. 
So in other words, if the level of sex that's happening in a marriage is high, then the level of sexual desire in the people in that marriage is also high. That would be awesome. And in much the same way, if the level of sex in a marriage is little to non-existent, then the level of sexual desire in the people in that marriage is also little to non-existent. Then that would be great because the fact that little to no sex is happening in the marriage wouldn't even be that big of a deal because it so happens that the people in that marriage have little to no sexual desire anyway, so it's not really going to bother them that there's little to no sex happening in their marriage. But unfortunately, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but I'd advocate that this is not the way it typically works. And the reality is that just because sex is not happening in a marriage, it does not mean that the people in the marriage are no longer sexual and that they no longer have sexual needs and desires. Or said another way, what happens if the level of sexual desire and activity in a marriage is very low but the level of sexual need and desire remains very high in either one or both of the partners in that marriage. So in other words, just because people come to the place for whatever reasons that they're having little to no sex in their marriage, it doesn't necessarily mean that either of the partners within that marriage are necessarily okay with living with little to no sex. So you can see how this situation would create a very counterproductive, if not destructive, situation within the context of a marriage and really be setting the marriage up for failure. So again, with that being said, I want to establish that I realize that this very real tension exists in many marriages and that many marriages struggle deeply around issues of sex. And therefore, there may be little to no sex happening in the context of these marriages. And I'm not unsympathetic to the reality that some folks who are listening to this podcast might, in fact, be in that very situation. And therefore, as we go through these 12 principles that we're about to go through, and we're talking about and focusing on the very real sexual needs and struggles that most men have when it comes to sex, I understand that some people in general, and some women specifically, might actually feel kind of bad, or confused, or overwhelmed, or afraid, or even pressured or coerced by these upcoming 12 principles. Because as they hear these 12 principles, they might actually begin to think thoughts or have feelings such as these. Oh my God, I feel pressured. And I better start having more sex with my husband, even if I don't want to have sex with my husband, because of these 12 principles that Tony is sharing are really true, then apparently my husband really needs to have sex. So I better have sex with my husband even if I don't want to have sex with my husband, because if I'm not having sex with my husband, then my husband might be really tempted to act out sexually. So now I have to worry about what my husband's been doing to get his sexual needs met, since I pretty much know that his sexual needs have not been getting met in the context of our marriage, because my husband and I almost never have sex. So you see that as this woman listens to these upcoming 12 principles that every wife should know about her husband when it comes to sex, she might interpret it as a sense of pressure or a sense of feeling coerced or a sense of being pushed to have sex with her husband even if she don't really want to have sex with her husband or even if she feels like she can't have sex with her husband for whatever reasons. So again, I just want to acknowledge and affirm that this would be a very real problem 
if a woman's feeling a sense of pressure and or coercion in any way to have sex, even with her own husband, because the sixth observation that I already shared states that under no circumstances whatsoever, 100% absolutely without exception, should any woman ever be pressured or coerced into having sex that's in any way a violation of her own conscience or personhood, even with her own husband. And thus, the very dilemma that I'm trying to bring clarity to before we get into these 12 principles. And with all that being acknowledged, it brings me to the eighth and final observation that I want to share with you guys before we actually get into the 12 principles. And that eighth observation is this. God's healing and redemption is available for every person and every marriage. Praise be to God. So what I'd like to do is finalize these eight introductory observations by inspiring hope for each and every one of us. And that hope, as this observation states, is that God's healing and redemption is available for every person and every marriage. So I just want you to know that if you're in the place for whatever reasons that you're struggling with sex, either within yourself or within your marriage, that there is hope in God and there's strength and wisdom and power in God and there's light and there's truth and forgiveness and salvation in God and there's healing and there's redemption in God. And if you or your marriage is in a difficult or troubled place, and you suspect or you know that you have some work to do to get in a healthier place, then I want you to be encouraged because I can assure you that there is no situation and there's no person and there's no marriage that's outside of God's redemptive reach. And I can tell you this, that if God can heal and redeem a man named Tony Ingracia that was as messed up and broken as I was, and if God can heal and redeem a messed up and broken woman like my wife Sherry, and God can heal and redeem and restore a messed up and broken marriage like our marriage was for so many years, then there's nothing too hard for God to do. And therefore, I'd advocate that if a married couple is in a deeply broken place in their marriage for whatever reasons, and that because of this, there's little to no sex happening between them, that the solution to their dilemma is not to stay broken, and it's not for them to continue to live with little to no sex within their marriage, and it's not for either one of them to act out sexually and to find sex and orgasms apart from their spouse, since they can't have sex and orgasms with each other, And it's not for either of them to continue to remain in the place where they are that's so broken and dysfunctional because they can't participate in a sexual relationship with each other. And instead, the solution is going to have something to do with them getting really honest about their situation and working through their stuff and doing some professional counseling if that's what they need to do and identifying some key issues that are still holding them in places of bondage and defeat, and working on and processing through those issues so they don't continue to hold the negative and destructive power that they've been holding for so long. And it's going to have something to do with inviting God into their hearts and their lives and their marriage and their situation in a deeper way than maybe they ever have before. And it's going to have something to do with exchanging the lies they've been believing with the truth of God and letting the light of God and the power of God and the wisdom of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God and the healing of God and the redemption of God into their hearts and lives and marriage and situation so that they can begin to function the way God intends for them to function as a married couple, in a healthier way and a more holy way 
in a more godly way than ever before. And so they can enter into and begin to enjoy God's will and God's design and plan, not only for their sexual relationship with each other, but also for their entire marriage and relationship in every way. And as a result, therefore, they will begin to honor God and honor one another with the expression of their sexual relationship within their marriage. And if I had to pick a proof text here, guys, I'd pick Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, that says, He brings good news to those who are poor. He binds up the brokenhearted. He proclaims freedom to those who are captive. He brings release for those in the darkness of prison. He comforts all those who mourn. He provides for those who are grieving. He bestows beauty to replace our ashes and a garment of praise where there has been a spirit of despair. Praise be to God. Because God always, always, always has a path that leads us from where we are to where he will take us if we're willing to turn toward him and seek him and surrender to him and listen to him and follow him. So please, dear listener, be encouraged and take heart because as this eighth observation states, God's healing and redemption is available for every person and every marriage. And with that being said, it finalizes the eight introductory observations that I wanted to share with you. And with that being said, you guys, it brings us to the first principle of the 12 things every wife should know about her husband when it comes to sex. And if you want to know what that first principle is, you're going to have to come back to the Power of Purity podcast next week where we will continue with the first of the 12 principles. So I'll invite you to come back and join me next week, and I'll look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, God bless you as you continue on the pathway of purity that God has intended for your heart and life. God bless you guys. Have an awesome day and have an awesome week, and I'll see you back here next week. Bye-bye now. Thanks for listening. Visit powerofpurity.org for more resources and information. And if this podcast has been helpful or encouraging, please invite a friend to listen. Until next time, remember... There's power in purity.